Hello everyone um, and welcome to this webinar on pain education best practice uh, co-hosted today uh, by the European um, Pain Federation, EFIC, and uh, the BPS, the British Pain Society. Uh, my name is Matthew Hall, I'm the Executive Director of the BPS and I'll be introducing today's discussions. Um, I'm joining you today from a very hot London um, and if you want to share what country or city you're joining us from today, uh, feel free to write that in the chat. Um, this webinar is scheduled to last for one hour today and I'll just point out it's being recorded so you can access it later. Uh, share it with uh, share it with colleagues or peers if you think uh, it might be of value to them as well. In terms of format, we're going to hear from uh, each of our panel of experts before we then lead into a Q&A session. You can ask a question really at any time throughout this, um, throughout this webinar. Um, you simply use the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and just to be aware, um, that is um, available uh, for everyone to view. Uh, and please do feel free um, to get a dialogue going, fire up a conversation, let us know your opinions and, and thoughts on some of the discussion today. Now, uh, before we go any further, um, I'd just like to flag up a couple of, of major events uh, coming up. Um, FX 2023 Congress is now just over two weeks away, taking place in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, late registration is open now if you haven't yet booked your place. Um, and you can also save the date for next year's uh, BPS annual scientific meeting as well. Uh, that's taking place in Nottingham in the United Kingdom from the 4th to the 6th of June 2024. Um, An early bird registration will be opening for that soon. Um, and we very much hope to see you there. So as I mentioned, the, the topic of today's webinar is pain education. Um, and if you're joining us here today, it's, it's probably quite likely that you already know what an important subject this is. Um, fundamentally, pain is a, is a really complex and multidimensional phenomena. It causes can be visible or invisible. Um, its impacts and effects can be determined by biological, psychological and social factors. It, it's often considered to be very subjective and, and a deeply, deeply personal issue. Even quite specific forms of pain have, have many different stakeholders, for want of a, a better term. Patients and healthcare professionals are usually the ones we think of first, but there are family, friends, researchers, policymakers and many more besides. So I think if we know that pain is complex and multidimensional, it, it stands for the reason that high quality pain education should be comprehensive and multidisciplinary. There's been some really huge advances in pain education in recent years, and we're going to hear about some of the fantastic initiatives and programs available. In particular, we're going to take a really detailed look at what the EFIC Academy can provide. We're also going to hear about some challenges. Um, the International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP, have previously commented describing pain education in many European universities as alarmingly inadequate and described how many health professionals report feeling unprepared to manage complex pain issues. Recently, the European Journal of Pain highlighted how little pain education features in undergraduate curricula. This is sometimes as little as 1% of program hours in the United Kingdom. So we're going to talk a little bit about barriers to progress as well. What actions we can all take to improve our own understanding, that of our colleagues, our peers around us. And ultimately, what our panel are aiming to do today is make sure they provide actionable recommendations, takeaways, so you know where to find that insight and, and education that's relevant for your needs. So uh, all that in mind, it's, it's time for me to stop talking um, and introduce you to our wonderful experts. Um, I'm just going to ask before we launch into the discussion proper, if we, if we could just uh, tell our audience a little bit about each of yourselves. Um, and if we could start off uh, with you, please, Ed. Yeah, sure. Hello. Uh, my name is Ed Keogh. I'm a professor of psychology. I'm based in the United Kingdom in, at the University of Bath. I'm also the deputy director of the Centre for Pain Research here in Bath. Um, and I've had a long standing interest in, in pain and researching pain have, with interest with sex and gender and psychological factors in pain. So my background is in psychology and very much interested in the way in which we communicate the psychology of pain to others. 
Um, I'm involved in ethic in terms of the pain education group, in particular the psychology stream, and that's where I'm, why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. And uh, over to you, Felicia. Good afternoon. My name is Felicia Cox. I'm a nurse consultant in pain management based in London. I'm also suffering the heat wave, or should I say, I'm experiencing the heat wave rather than suffering, bearing in mind that Ed is here. Um, I am uh, the co-editor of the British Journal of Pain together with Professor Roger Nags, our current president. I'm the co-chair of the EFIC Nurse Education Group along with Dr Nadia Nestler. And I am the Secretary of the International Association for the Study of Pain, Acute Pain SIG. So I'm delighted actually to have taken over the leadership of the Nurse Education Group in EFIC. I've also been doing some work with the EFIC Academy and also with both IASP and the British Pain Society. So thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Felicia, and welcome. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Morton. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Morten Hui. I'm an Associate Professor at Auburn University in Denmark. Uh, my background is a physio. I've been clinically working for many, many years and then sort of transitioned into academia more recently. Um, my, my sort of scope here and, and generally speaking is to, to give people a broader understanding of what pain is and particularly this multidimensional nature of the complex or chronic pain or whatever we should call it. Uh, and I've been working with that uh, quite extensively and, and most recently as the chair of the EFIC Academy, which I'll come back to later. Wonderful. Thank you, Morton. Um, right. So those are our those are our panelists for today. As I say, again, feel free to ask questions throughout this session. Uh, we might not answer them as we go, but any particularly good ones, we'll make sure we tackle them at the end. Um, so we'll go back to the start of the lineup. And um, Ed, if I could ask you uh, to begin the uh, discussion, please. Certainly, I'll just get some slides up for you to see. Hopefully you can see those. Matthew, can you? They are clear on screen. Thank you. Excellent. Brilliant. OK, so uh, very much my, my, my role here is going to be to first of all sort of introduce uh, what, we, what we're really to be talking about here, set the scene, if you like. Um, as I've been sort of having a role within the psychology group, you'll see I'll, I'll bring some of the sort of observations I have around um, some of the challenges and opportunities around uh, pain education from the sort of psychology perspective. And so I've got you some sort of insights sort of very much around what some of the work we've been doing in, in ethics and, and some of the opportunities there. So really starting off, I think if we're thinking about what educa pain education actually is, I think obviously the first starting point, so well, who is it for, what's needed, et cetera. And uh, yeah, I know this is probably just stating the obvious, but you know, the, the, the when we talk about pain education, we do need to think about the different audiences that are involved because we might need to tailor the message, et cetera. And I've listed a few of the most obvious examples on, on, the, on, the, on the slides here to sort of run through each of these, think about the way in which you might sort of deliver slightly different types of message. Certainly, if we think about different audiences, then I think, you know, primarily, you know, right at the forefront are people with lived experience. And we know that, uh, you know, uh, you know getting, help, helping individuals understand what pain actually is and, pr and providing key information about what one should do when one's in pain, who to go to, et cetera, is of critical importance. There's a lot of information out there, and I think that's both a plus and a negative. The plus is that there's information out there that you can seek it, but also there's there's difficulties as well in terms of accessing the right type of information. So we do need to have reliable, accurate information that's suited to individual needs. And of course, that's one of the issues that cuts across all of these different groups. But certainly we're thinking about people with lived experience, understanding what pain is, where it comes from, self-management, those sorts of factors are, are of our critical importance. We need to sort of do a good job in making sure those resources are there and, and can steer people towards them. Policymakers is another example if we want to sort of change the way in which uh, pain you know, is provided or, or the way in which the governments, et cetera, are, are approaching pain then certainly we need to be providing information to bring people up to speed with respect to what's at the cutting edge around what pain is and how it's best managed. We can broaden out even further and go into, sort of, if you like, into the more public domain as well. And sort of, and a lot of some of the work that I've certainly involved in is around communicating what pain is to a more general audience and thinking, so getting involved in, in media, et cetera, and, and, and really trying to communicate some of the key difficulties we have around even just what, defining what pain is and how that has an impact in terms of how it's reported and also uh, how we think about managing pain. 
Um, I think very much what we're going to be talking about today is going to be very much focused on healthcare professionals. And so, and so very much some, a lot of the work that's, that's been going on within ethic has been around setting up and providing resources which are geared towards people who are working in practice, clinical health practitioners, and also those with those who are training and, and, and developing their own research and clinical skills and around the different sort of disciplines that are involved in pain. So there's a lot of resource you know, that's, that's currently being developed that we hope will be of, of use to those interested in developing the, so their core educational skills. So, so, so cutting across all of these different groups, I think one of the sort of key challenges is that you know, we need up to date, accurate information. It needs to be reliable. There's resources that are tailored towards individual needs, different backgrounds, and also different locations. And again, taking a more European slant here, you know, thinking about what is actually relevant to each individual country, as well as what are the more generic features actually are. We need to be able to reflect this in, in the resources that are provided. Um, there are some opportunities, and obviously, as this is an ethic and BPS um, sort of webinar, then you know, both at the national and the international level, there are pain networks that we can hopefully bring people together who have expertise and are able to share this the, the good practice and to also help develop resources that can be shared across our, our community. So I think there are some real opportunities here, and that's certainly one of the reasons why I've been sort of interested in getting involved in this particular initiative. So in terms of the, so if you like, the, from the ethic perspective, uh, there's in terms of the, sort of the approach that they're taking, there's a range of different initiatives that are currently being uh, undertaken from developing core curricula, and I'll show you the example and a link to those in a moment, but also how that might then translate into developing exams or, a diplo or diplomas within the sort of core, the four core disciplines that are currently being covered. There are pain schools, and also, as you'll hear later from Morton, there's a, the Pain Academy and a learning uh, platform which is being developed, which sort of links in with the curricula and the Pain Summit, which is also uh, being being developed. So there's a range of different resources, and they, they, you can see those on the the Ethic webpage. I mentioned the core curricula, and certainly here you can see examples of where within the sort of different core domains or different disciplines. There are core curricula which are being developed within pain medicine, physiotherapy, nursing and psychology. And I was very happy to be involved in the psychology uh, curricula that was developed a few years back. Uh, and there's a link in, in, the, in, the, in the slides there on the web page, which will link you to that. And that goes through some, some of the sort of core relevant factors that may be considered within each of these individual disciplines. Um, as well as the curricula, then, as I mentioned, there are other sort of learning opportunities, and certainly for healthcare professionals in particular, such as, you know, webinars, professional education days, such as these, uh, but also the, the conferences, which you heard Matthew speak about um, earlier, both at a national and international level, and these often all have study days or refresher courses, which are opportunities to sort of link in and bring stuff up to speed across different disciplines. I think that's quite a key feature of these sort of, these, these sort of meetings where you do get to talk outside of your own particular domain. The Pain Education Summit, uh, of which there's been a couple, and there's one being planned for next year, again, is another opportunity for healthcare professionals to get much more involved in, bring, again, bringing themselves up to speed and actually listening to both disciplinary, but also interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approaches. So that you can sort of start finding out what's going on outside of your particular domain again. So these are sort of all interlinked and in the curricula certainly are, are feeding into the sort of the types of sessions that are within the summit. And these will, as, as um, Morton will talk about later, are linked in with this uh, e-learning platform academy. So there's some resources which are being which are being developed. I mentioned psychology, I think, a couple of times, certainly from my own perspective, when sort of reflecting on where we currently are from, from a, a psychology discipline. Um, I think, you know, reiterating what we heard very much earlier on is that there are various routes into pain for psychologists and actually across Europe. And there's a number of different terms you've probably come heard of or come across with, which are different, such as clinical psychology and health psychology. However, generally, I'm thinking more from maybe the UK perspective, I'd say that pain does not appear within the undergraduate curricula, which might be different from other disciplines. In fact, I was, I think I was very fortunate in my own undergraduate degree of 20, 25 years maybe a little longer than 20 years ago, um, was I actually did have the opportunity to have a pain, psycho pain psychology being being uh, incorporated within our undergraduate programme. But I think that's highly unique and, and it doesn't often happen. And it's not until you get to a more postgraduate level, you might start to develop an interest in pain. 
So then the question is, how do you provide resources for, for those psychologists to, to encourage them to get involved in this area? So it's not included, the, that thing is not included as a standard training. And so therefore we're thinking about, well, how best do we pro help provide resources for those interested? And think about how, what sort of skills you might want to see developed. Um, and that's not just within those who have a sort of a, a strong psychology background in psychology, a career in psychology, but also outside of, of this domain as well. And also how, what can we learn from other, other particular groups? So I think from the psychology state, there's a lot, there's some opportunities here, but there's a considerable number of challenges, especially around the career pathways that people get into, into, into pain. Okay, I think I've come to the end of my slices, where it's just to give you that opening sort of set of things to sort of start thinking about, also the broader context in which we're operating. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ed. And, and a really, um, really helpful introduction there. I think as we move through the um, the other slides, I, I think it'll be fascinating, particularly when you talk about some of those opportunities and challenges um, to see how they manifest in other fields. And uh, we're now going to hear from uh, Felicia Cox um, looking at nursing um, and the current opportunities and threats across Europe in pain education. Thanks very much, Ed. Just having a slight, few slight technical issues there. So um, thank you very much. And building on uh, what you have been talking about, I'd like to now to share with you what I've been up to with regards um, pain management for the nursing members of the EFIC Academy. So my name is Felicia Cox, as I mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the nursing group, together with my colleague, Dr. Nadia Nestler. And we are actually meeting this Thursday, Friday and Saturday in Brussels to discuss taking forward the nursing diploma examinations. What's the current situation? We have the core curriculum for European Diploma for Pain Ma Management Nursing. And um, the problem is across Europe, we have such a wide disparity in access to pain education at both an undergraduate and postgraduate level. And actually a wide variety of different uh, opportunities for nurses within and across Europe. So significant uh, variations in practice with not necessarily levels of qualification at the point of registration, but actually registration is not compulsory in some European countries. There are great examples um, from individual countries about um, knowledge and skills frameworks, etc. And we're so blessed now to have the EFIC core curriculum to standardise our access to education and also our educational opportunities. So um, the educational curriculum for nursing was developed by this group of nurses together with Morton um, some years ago. And uh, we're very grateful to Dr. Emma Briggs, who is the chair at the time of this nurse education group and the work that she had undertaken uh, with the, all of the other current members are actively involved in the setting of the preparation for the diploma next year. So I'll be speaking a little bit more about that shortly. This is the current state of play. Now, this is quite a challenge to actually undertake. So I attempted to map current provision of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate education. There was very little about undergraduate education. I qualified as a registered general nurse in Australia way back in the 1980s. We didn't have any pain education in our undergraduate training whatsoever. But you can see here that there are various different options across Europe. So in Portugal, there is a pain module that you can undertake, not necessarily at any academic level, whereas wide variation across Europe. Historically, Ireland were the first to have a master's program in clinical practice. It was a two years master's program set up by um, some educational experts such as Dr. Lazarina O'Connor and um, has now no longer available for nurses to access within Ireland. And they're undertaking master's level education um, in the UK. 
Historically in the UK, it was face-to-face -face training, but now the only options are hybrid or mainly virtual settings. So it's a two-year course or sometimes a three-year course at UCL, for instance, but they are very expensive. In Den sorry, in Denmark, there is master's levels program as there is in Germany. But a good example is in Holland, where they have a very proactive team. Uh, you can actually undertake a two years a two year qualification and gain a nurse consultant post. So you can see wide variation, but there's only a smattering of access to postgraduate education across Europe. So I think that's one of the drivers of the EFIC Academy as well, to be able to have access virtually to quality education from experts. Now, I'm not an educationalist, I'm a clinical practitioner with an interest in education, but I think research and education underpin all of our practices. So to set the standard, in 2015, I led in the United Kingdom a knowledge and skills framework for nursing. This involved academic nurses and nurses working in clinical practice. We're very lucky in the UK that we have wonderful access to master's level education. And uh, the majority of nurses who are working in pain management as either nurse consultants or clinical nurse specialists have master's level qualifications. Most recently, one of the members of the EFIC group, Martin Galligan, who's based at the Marsden, has further built on the work that I did when I was the chair of the Royal College of Nursing Pain and Palliative Care Forum. And he has developed a UK career framework for pain management nurses. And this also builds on the EFIC core curriculum for nurses. Within Germany, however, there is also a Schmetz expert program. If we're thinking about the levels of education across Europe, where does the diploma sit for both, well, I should say, for physiotherapy, for psychology, and also pain management nursing? So you can see here on the left, this is the European Qualifications Framework. And uh, we have on the left from level one, right through to the right to level eight, which is doctoral level. So our diploma sits here at level six. And this will inform the process for the examinations. There are lots of different examples of best practice um, in small groups across the UK. So the Pain Nurse Network is free to access, it's global. Uh, we have um, many hundreds of members and it's an opportunity for nurses to share best practice and also to gain other uh, support from peers, colleagues and also mentorship. The Irish Pain Nurses and Midwives Society is also available, but there is a small fee to join. In Germany, they have the German Pain Nurses Group and also in Holland. So significant resources, but actually isolated to country level. In 2004, Judy Watt Watson, who'll be known to many pain educationalists, led a survey for IASP, and this was exploring pain education provision in under, undergraduate curricula. This was repeated by Dr. Emma Briggs in the UK in 2011. And then in EFIC 2023, we're also undertaking a survey of access to pain education. And I'll share a slide with you about that at the end. So we have set some key dates for the nursing diploma. So I will be hosting the examinations in London in May 2024, and oh, sorry, May 2024 on the 24th of May, in fact. And uh, th this will be very followed very shortly by the next educational summit. So you can see here we have our strategy meeting this weekend, a further consolidation meeting when we meet at EFIC in Budapest. And applications will be limited to 20 applicants for this first round and applications will close on March 24, although they may close beforehand because I think we might reach saturation. There's a significant interest, particularly in um, Western Europe, for nurses to undertake this examination. One thing when I first met with Sam Kinman, the executive director of EFIC at um, the EFIC meeting in Dublin, when we had a nurse uh, meeting to discuss the potential for the examinations and for the diploma was that nurses mainly English isn't their first language. Physicians have historically across Europe undertaken their examinations in English, as have the physiotherapists. But actually we have special dispensation to test 
uh, on our test subjects who will be native English speakers in the, in the UK first of all. And then we're very lucky to have uh, some linguists who will be able to translate all of these resources into Spanish, German and Dutch for other nursing groups across Europe. So we plan to have the second set of examinations in German, led by Dr. Nadia Nessler and uh, also some other German and Austrian and Swiss-based nurses. So this is a great um, opportunity for nurses who are not necessarily native English speakers. And Dr. Brona Fulham, who's the current president of EFIC, has also identified that some physiotherapists are, would struggle to be examined in English. And I think that some nurses would even be um, uh, struggle to be examined in English. So it, it's great. So keep that date in mind, May 24th, 2024, and the examinations will be at the Royal College of Anaesthetists in central London. So the examination format will be not dissimilar to that undertaken by the physiotherapists. So we'll be having part one will be multiple choice questions. Historically, this has always been in a two part series with uh, the multiple choice questions done in advance virtually, followed by if you pass these, then you are invited to attend for um, your OSCEs and also to undertake some complex case discussions. But for nursing, recognising the wide disparity in undergraduate and postgraduate education, we have agreed to have just two complex case discussions that will be submitted in advance. So we have further reading here. I carry a copy of the core curriculum everywhere I go because I'm always thinking about, you know, preparation and planning, particularly around the multiple choice questions, because we're very lucky to have a pool of questions from the physiotherapists and also the physicians. But this will be very much a nurse led examination. And um, I'm delighted to say that I'll be in. Um, we have uh, our first ever nurse plenary for EFEC, a dedicated session. Sarien van Berkel, who is also a member of the nursing group, will be delivering a plenary on nursing and nurse education at EFEC in Budapest. And finally, uh, Dr. Brona Fullen and Mary O'Keefe have asked me to share with you the EFIC survey. Uh, this is um, what we're aiming to do here is actually examine where we are with regards to the provision of pain education across all different disciplines, both at an undergraduate and also a postgraduate level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felicia. Um, that was really, really fascinating. And um, I thought particularly interesting was that slide of, of the European map and you know, what, what are those reasons behind such a disparity in qualifications between countries that would appear to have similar um, healthcare sectors, similar cultures, geographically very close? Um, perhaps some people in the in the chat or, or in the Q&A have some views on that themselves. Perhaps it's something we can uh, we can investigate later in the discussion. Thank you. Um, Morton, over over to you. Thank you. And uh, sounds okay? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Perfect. Well, thank you for letting me follow up on this uh, two excellent presentations and sort of paving the way for me. Uh, when we planned this, we, we talked a lot about why why do people do the exes these exams? And uh, and I'm going to sort of try and, and open up for that. So first of all, I think, uh, it, at least if you are physio, you you'll be familiar with this book explain pain that seems to have sort of led what many people refer to as a pain revolution it, it sort of brought about uh, metaphorical understandings of the science as opposed to so the by so the neuroscience as it were as opposed to sort of more biomedical science and gave an easy access to understanding the difference between a biomedical and a more biopsychosocial approach to understanding pain um, these metaphors have have then now and before that been sort of translated into what is really the science and how does that tra translate to the clinic but essentially what what many people think when we talk about pain and pain education for professionals they think about this the science of pain but as you saw in in the previous presentation actually the science and knowledge is only one bit of it and what people tend not to realize is that the other bits are actually much more extensive um, uh, a couple of, of master students at Orbe University 
did uh, just recently did a study on this and they, they showed that actually the majority of people know more about or perceive to know more about the first bit uh, than they do about the others. So, so people who would say I'm confident in understanding pain science, they, they lack the understanding of how to assess it and how to measure it and how to make people go back to work or how to differentiate between toddlers and young adults or even older adults. So, so this sort of um, broadness of the spectrum that is encapsulated into the curriculum is is what many people are missing and if we then take a look at the people who have actually done the exams uh, they they are some of them are, are have have come back to effort and say they they won't mind being being advocates for the exam so these are of course um, privileged people who think they they did well and we think they did well and all of that but all the same these are experiences from people who have done the exams already uh, and I like this one. So it's wonderful to get lost in the extensive literature. So really trying to understand that, but also that the experience of this person from from Holland was that the examiners really showed an interest, not just for academic purposes, but really in the clinic as well. And, and he perceived it as an interesting conversation. So what this speaks to in my mind is that many people, when you talk about an examination is really scaring. But in fact, what it is, it's, it's, a, it's a discussion between peers who all have a similar interest and share a similar background. So the curriculum is what we need to know. And then the exams are for obviously is how to test it, but it's much more than that. Here's another quote. Uh, I believe that every physical therapist should participate because it helps us improve, enhance and push forward. Uh, a guy from, from Greece in this case. And, and then the, the final one here, um, Andrea, who also did the exam very well as well, he, uh, he said it, it's help, help him to broaden and expand his knowledge and, and it will for everyone he poses and even helps our patients. So it, by us understanding this broader perspective of pain science, as it were, really is also helpful in the clinic. So if the question is why would we want to do this, well, I guess some of it would be to understand the full reach of what we need to work with and what we're doing but again there's a lot of things that goes on in terms of also uh, being a better clinician perhaps what EFIC has been trying to do uh, with the development of the uh, academy which i'm going to talk briefly about now so the academy is is many things i'm just going to touch upon the platform here so during covid um, EFIC decided to, to develop this educational platform for people who wanted to understand more about pain and, and the platform is built upon the, the curricula, just like the pain summit, as, as I mentioned earlier. So, so the curriculum is the backbone and every, every video you see here is sort of tied in. So if you want to know about a specific part of the curriculum, you can go in here to sort of be inspired bearing in mind that not everything is covered as it is. But here's a short video, I'll just take you through it. So here you can see there's different modules, uh, different curricula, of course, and there are practice exams for the existing exams, there is access to webinars. Um, so these are things you could find. So let's say I was interested in pain medicine, and I click in here, it will take me to the different modules that are now in the pain. So if I was doing self-directed learning, I could go in and say, I think chronic widespread pain might be interesting. And you go in here and these are recordings uh, with learning objectives and, and references to the curriculum and everything. There's even uh, material, reading material, and there's a webinar and there's even a quiz so that you can test your knowledge afterwards. So this sort of very comprehensive build that is on the platform or part of the EFIC Academy can then lead for um, patients, or sorry, for, for uh, doctors in hopefully um, this year to actually be accredited for their work. So you can go in and do self-directed learning online, and then you can get CME accreditation. This is not accredited yet, so we're still waiting for the accreditation. Everything's been submitted, and we hope it will be soon. Um, we also uh, open to explore other things, such as for nursing, for instance, so that you can actually go in do self-directed learning and do bits of it at a time. By the end of you know the whole curriculum, you'd be uh, very well suited to do the EFIC exams. But on the other hand, whilst doing it, you could also collect uh, credits.
So we have we've tried to create this sort of uh, in, uh, educational environment that we hope people would benefit from. Uh, just as a matter of of uh, um, disclosure here, there is a there's a payment to be member of the academy. So coming behind a paywall does have a price, but it's very low. It's it's a few euros. Um, and, and there are different options, so for group uh, signs up and, and, and bigger bigger things as well. But you can explore that on the EFIC website. So let me just take you into the EDPP, the European Diploma in Pain Physiotherapy, as an example. What does the exam look like? We just heard how the nurses is planning theirs, and this is just sort of just having a quick look at how the, the existing exams for the, for the physios could look. Uh, the first one is an, an MCQ this year, it will be in November, so if anyone's listening and still interested, you can still sign up both for the MD if you're a doctor or for the PT if you're a physio. You do uh, an online, and actually if you go into the website again, as we did here before, you can see there's actually a mock exam here. So you can go into the mock exam, there's a, a range of questions, 10 in this case. The first one is which of the following best describe one on a VAS? And that would be pain detection threshold. Then you can check if it's true, happened to be true. And then you could go on to the next one. And then if you look uh, in the top right hand corner, you can see there's even a timer on it. So 19 minutes left. So you have to do it on time as well, which is also very close to how it will be in the exams. Once you've done that uh, and scored it, uh, there will be a while. So in this case, it will be next year where you can go to Leuven in Belgium and do the exams uh, for now, as, as also Flit was mentioning, everything now is done in Belgium, the practical sides, but uh, who knows, I, I imagine that it will be very beneficial to do it in different countries, countries and different uh, languages with the nurses. So I, I suppose and hope that will sort of transition into the, to the physio world as well. And the practicals is basically doing the case reports first, handing them in, and then you have a viva discussing clinical reasoning and there's also a patient, so it's literally, it's not a patient, it's, a, it's an actor playing a patient role. And then you do your clinical examinations on someone pretending to be a patient and having to respond to uh, nonverbal language and, and pain responses and interpret their, their responses to your testing, etc. So this is, this is how the exam would look. And just to, to finish off, I'll point to some of the resources. Uh, including the uh, EFIC YouTube channel, where you can go and find webinars such as this and, and others as well. These are free. There will also be a range of um, interviews from the EFIC TV, which is interviews primarily done at the European Pain Congress. Uh, there will be live interviews coming up in two weeks' time when the Budapest Congress is going on as well. So do sign up for that. And, uh, and there's a pain summit in May next year. I think that does it for me. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Morton. And and thank you particularly for that that sort of practical look at the um at the resources available. It can be somewhat hard to visualize them sometimes. So to see that on screen was was really useful. Um we've had some really interesting questions um come through and uh we'll move into into that phase of the, the webinar now. And, and we're going to start with a question from Helena. And I think this could be quite a big, a big question. Um, Helena's trying to propose a pain education quality improvement initiative in, in their hospital. Um, and they're particularly keen to hear about panelists' thoughts and ideas on how to change colleagues' attitudes to patients in pain. Um, who would like to who, I, I can see a few a few knowing looks appearing on the on the panelists faces who would like to take this one first can i start of course i, I think back to um one of my role models in pain management and that was professor eloise carr she did lots of work around uh, barriers to pain management so you have the individual barrier the, the patient you have the let's say the nurse barrier the professional but you also have institutional barriers so it comes down to education and just i think there's a lot of learning that is done from adverse events, uh, but we really don't like adverse events. But um, this is often what changes practice. So having um, clear instructions or education for patients about setting standards in advance of their surgery. So making sure they have clear expectations of what to expect around the time. I'm just using surgery as an example. Um, surgery and um, getting patients, uh, I'm just saying, 
becoming familiar what it, with whatever assessment tool is being used and actually making certain that nurses on the ward, because they're the ones that have spent more time with the patient than anybody else, are aware of the impact of poorly managed acute pain on the patient's journey and actually the impact that this can have not only on, on the physical side, but actually on the spiritual, emotional and you know, psychological side. So I think education is key. In the words of Tony Blair, education, education, education. Yeah, if I can just add on that, I think uh, changing a whole setup and a place and, and um, interestingly, I suppose there'll be someone saying that there's all these idiots trying to promote pain as a thing. We've been treating it all along. So I guess it's a spectrum thing. Um, I, I've, I've had a few experiences with trying to change these things over you know, big workplaces such as hospitals or, or, or municipality settings. And what I find most useful is starting out, finding out why would you even want to change? So what is it that you want to move away from so that the, the, that direction is a given, not the, the means to the direction, as it were? Um, because it, it may be that you could have all these ideas and you, you could be alone and, and pulling that as a single person in a ward is, is unlikely to be successful. And I'll add to this. Um, and actually, I would like to just reiterate what's actually just appeared in the chat, which I think was what I was going to say. Early intervention, I think, is, is helpful here, which means getting into uh, undergraduate, postgraduate curriculum, and actually working from, if you like, that, that level so that it infiltrates and, and, the, and, the, and the message comes through. That's obviously a long term strategy, but certainly I think that level of raising awareness and embedding it is, is one way forward. I think, I Sorry, Morton. No, sorry. Let me just say that Harriet uh, Witting, who's uh, mm. the, the lead of the physio um, curriculum, has actually led the work of a, an undergraduate physio curriculum. And they, there is one for MD as well. Uh, but coming from the curriculum into implementation at, un, at universities or university colleges uh, is obviously a, a big issue. But, but since pain has gotten more on the, on the agenda in, in many places, it's, it's easier. But it's, it's still, there's a lot of structural um, and, and organisational issues that needs to be tackled as well. Obviously, that shouldn't mean we should give up. It's just saying that if, if you fight the fight and you don't think you're getting anywhere, don't, don't give up. It's a hard work and, and teaming up, I guess, is the best thing to do. And, and obviously, I would argue that showing your own qualifications, showing that you actually have qualifications that are accredited is, is what I think the, a nice first step. Yeah, thanks. And I think benchmarking can be very useful. I spent some time when I first set up an, an inpatient pain service, I was supported by Dr. D. Burroughs, who at that time was a postdoctoral fellow. And she um, utilized the attitude to pain questionnaire. But what's interesting, I've done it at different time points, you know, since then, not much has changed around the attitude of pain. And um, Eloise and I know Judy Watt Watson would say the same. We've been educating for years, but we still find patients on the ward who may be reporting pain have an intervention, but we fail as nurses to go back and actually assess the effectiveness of the intervention. So we have we still have a lot of work to do, but I do think that what we've been able to achieve across all our different disciplines is raise awareness of pain and actually the importance of pain. And I noticed that Pete had popped in the chat about supported pain management, supported self-management. And I think that is absolutely key. What I really liked because I was in Leuven and I watched, observed the physio exams was actually the approach of the physios in their assessment of the of the clinical patient, uh, of the um, the sympax, how they um, were at the same level of the patient and they listened to the patient and there's just the the lovely interaction, you know, lots of active listening rather than just in instruction. Wonderful, thank you, thank you all. Very uh, very insightful answers. Um, the next one I'd like to talk about is uh, from Emmanuel. And, and if you'll, you'll forgive me, Emmanuel, I'm going to ask your, your question slightly differently. Um, he, he asks about EFIC having a multidisciplinary curriculum. And I suppose I would ask the panel, is, is this something uh, that should be worked towards in the future? Are there reasons that the curriculum are uh, different? Um, what, why isn't there a multidisciplinary curriculum? curriculum and, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of that approach if yeah if you don't mind i go first is that okay 
Of course. Yeah, so so um, so IAS actually has a, a multidisciplinary curriculum. They they used to have a core curriculum. It's called, uh, and it was seen as as maybe the apex of what you needed to know about pain. Um, but what came about was when the doctors made theirs. It, it was quite clear what the doctors needed to know, but not what everyone else needed to know. And it turns out that when we divert into doing different um, curricula and bear in mind that a part of the curriculum is always interdisciplinary. Uh, what, what is your role in the interdisciplinary work and how do you utilize the benefits and resources of other professionals? So, so we, we are talking interdisciplinarity, but the, the curriculum itself is monodisciplinary. And I had the fortune of sitting in when, the, when we developed the, the, the nurses and the psychology and, and the physios. And I can tell you they're vastly different. There are there are things that are so normal for, for nurses that needs to go into their curriculum that would not be mentioned with the psychologists and vice versa and physios as well. So I think there's a benefit for having these quite directional operational curricula which EFIC has developed that that sort of tells you not only what to know, but also in a taxonomic way, how much you need to know about it. Uh, and keep those monodisciplinary, but but I completely agree that we should stress, and we are doing that hopefully, that the multidisciplinary work and how to utilize each uh, each other in you know to the best of the person with pain is is so important. I just add to that also. I mean, no, no, when we were developing the psychology curricula, that that certainly embedded within it, there was you know sort of other disciplines coming into that, so that actually is in there. But also when thinking about the summit and the way in which that's structured, there are certainly, if you like, disciplinary streams, but there are actually also a number of interdisciplinary cross-cutting themes that you're getting different perspectives coming into this. So I think within certainly within the, the summit and, the, and, and on the academy, there are sort of resources there which really are cutting across you know, core topics. So I think you are going to get that coming through there. Matthew, you're muted. Good spot. Thank you very much. Someone, someone had to do it, didn't they? Um, so really, th this is about you know we we need distinct curricula, but it's important that we share that best practice that that those curricula talk to each other. And all, and also, I think these are evolving and developing at different phases. So certainly, I know from the psychology perspective, again, I mean, that was one of the later ones that came through. And so we've not yet got as far as the, the, the exam and the diploma side of things, where the other disciplines are much more ahead. Uh, and that's interesting in, in that we can obviously look at what has, uh, what's going on there and, and borrow <laughs> the, the things that work. But also, there's challenges there as well. Um, you know, to what extent would multiple choice questions be appropriate, for example, for, for, for psychology, et cetera. It's those sorts of questions that we're, we're currently thinking about. Can I, can I add one to that? Um, because there was an early question, I think that's when Fleet was talking, there was an early question um, regarding uh, why not all healthcare professionals have a curriculum. And I think the psychologists are a really good example of that because it, it takes so many resources to sit down and really think this through and have a peer reviewing process and all of that, and then develop the, the preceding exams and all of that. So it, it's really massive. And, and the amount of people with the psychology pain interest is perhaps, you know, a bit less, but th there was a general consensus in the beginning that we need the psychologists on board to show that this is important. Not to say that others aren't, but just to highlight the fact that we actually need a sort of you know whatever uh, an amount of people to to bear this uh they're not resources coming from outside it's driven by people who want to do this in the in the spare time and and maybe uh just to reflect on Raphael's question as well if this could be applicable for the latin american population uh, i can say that although it's called the ethic exams we have uh definitely i know for the physios I, i'm not sure about the doctors but definitely for physios we have uh, for, all, for all exams, there's been people from outside of Europe as well. So, so we, it's just because it's called a European Pain Federation, but it doesn't mean that neither the exam nor the curriculum is, is only for, for Europeans. So on the contrary, I would say, we, we just, uh, we're just finishing a revised version of the European Diploma for Pain Physiotherapy uh, curriculum. And, and, and there's a lot of things now that are being embedded into the curriculum that were only sort of maybe mentioned briefly, uh, such as 
differences in, you know, that could be how you identify yourself as a gender and how that means, uh, what, what sort of meaning that has for you when you meet the, 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 the pain people in the world, whatever. So all of these differences of, of, of how we interact with how people with pain interact with the healthcare system has become much more evident over the last uh, six, seven years. So they are built into the curriculum. I think they're, they're, you know, they're valid all across the world. They're not just European. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to a, a, um, a further question now. And th this is really talking about uh, best practice and guidelines. And, and particularly, um, this person asks, um, when they were doing research recently, they, they found it hard to access that information, that best practice and, and guidance. Um, and interested to know how, uh, how that's impacting uh, your approaches to teaching best practice and perhaps you could offer some thoughts on, um, on on good sources for that that guidance and where to find it. I'm sorry was there any specific context or discipline or was it just for any form of pain management in particular because I, maybe I'll talk about inpatient acute pain so we consider the bible from the um, ANSCA so the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists which is the scientific evidence which is currently in its fifth edition published in 2020 as our our guide to best evidence we also have the um, prospect studies and uh, we also have a variety of different uh, websites that we utilize but I can pop those in the chat for you very much procedure specific I have to say and particularly around um, uh, specific clinical indications and specific clinical problems I could just add on so we talked about um, where, where does I think there's a question about where does the curriculum stop and where does just good practice begin so to speak and and what we try to keep as a guideline uh, when developing the, the the curriculum is always is this pain specific or is this just being part of a being a good psychologist or nurse or doctor or physio so what do you need for instance being able to do like say motivating motivational interviewing to mention that is that part of the curriculum it wouldn't be for physios at least because that would be part of being a an up-to-date patient-centered physiotherapist but you may know something specific to pain, which could be uh, the complex patient, how to how to communicate with the patient with comorbidity, comorbidities and pain. And, and that would be then in the curriculum where MI could be mentioned as as one way to go about it. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Lars um, and Lars says, acknowledging the importance of patient education, uh, does EFIC have any plans or thoughts into making a core curriculum for that area, for patient education? Well, uh, I, I can say no, uh, as far as I know. I don't think there is, Lars. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, may, maybe a curriculum is not the thing, but definitely I think... Um, a good place to start will be policy. The reason I don't think a curriculum is is the right place to start is because there's no there's no sort of existing organisation around patient education. But but what what we could do is, of course, we could have a policy or we could have uh, an opinion or or consensus about w how to engage. Uh, I know there's a lot of um, research on the topic of patient education. It actually covers many, many aspects from shared decision-making to explaining pain neurobiology. So it's a really broad perspective and, and um, the evidence of course speaks one language, but I think that the overall thing that does, that is included in all the curricula of course, is, is inviting the patient to be the expert that patients really are on their own pain. Thank you, Morton. Um, and a, a question from, from Neil, um, do you think for allied health professionals, there needs to be a pathway to be a non-medical consultant in pain? Sounds like a UK thing with pathways. 
I was just thinking it's it's a UK thing. So we have various different uh, consultant levels of practice. We have the um, consultant level of practice for pharmacists, for instance. I know um, two pain pharmacists uh, that have recently attained that level. There is consultant. There are consultant level physiotherapists, certainly, and also some advanced practitioners. So the generic advanced practitioner um, posts. Um, there are consultant levels. So if you just want to have a look at the HE, NHSE, so Health Education England have just recently published their, their document. So that covers enhanced, advanced and also consultant level practice. For nurses, slightly different. The Royal College of Nursing is just about to launch in three weeks time their enhanced, advanced and consultant level practice. It will be the first time that we have actually, as nurses, had a clear definition and scope of practice for enhanced level practice. So if anybody would like to contact me about those, just please direct, get in touch with me directly. Wonderful. Thank you, Felicia. Um, right, we've got just a few minutes left. So what I'm going to do is we've heard a lot of information, a lot of different things today, and I'd like to ask each of the panelists just for one key recommendation or, or takeaway uh, for the audience here today, one one piece of action you'd love them to take or or one resource you'd really recommend to them. And um, Felicia, uh, as you are on my screen right now, uh, maybe we could start with you. Just just one thing, Matthew. OK, you can you can have two. You can have two. two. Yeah, um, I think. For me, nursing really needs to have pain education embedded in undergraduate curricula. And that covers everything from recognition of somebody in pain, the assessment of pain, and actually evidence-based management strategies. I use that rather than treatment strategies. And then secondly would be about actually um, exploring more and actually developing more resource about supporting patients to self-manage their pain. Now, Pain, man pain is a biopsychosocial and also spiritual feature. And we also have the complication in patients with cancer pain about that model of total pain. So for me, it would be about working with people li with lived experience. And I cite Pete Moore, Louise Trewern as its fine examples, together with the GAPA program developed by IASP. So Blair Smith, you know, has been um, absolutely fundamental in leading that. So be about engaging with people with lived experience and allowing them to drive the conversation and to drive the changes in practice. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Morton, if I could ask you for your 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 one or maybe two key yeah. takeaways. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to reflect on Helena's question uh, where she talks about uh, resources being removed. So educational resources being removed um, because of some relations to, to the opioid crisis in the US. Um, one of the key aspects in, in creating the online platform was to create uh, evidence based high quality, as it were, uh, educational materials that were non affected, non biased, non sponsored by the industry. So we, we, we have that continuous dis discussion about how to make it affordable and accessible and get people to do it without having any industrial uh, sponsorships. And, and whilst uh, the industry could buy access and give it to people, they can't sponsor things that go on on the, the website as it is. Um, and the other thing is, so we try to keep that bit, so keep the material out there. We also try, we have a, a, a position in how to how to try and, and update it. So it's, it's also fairly updated and, and there are learning questions to add to it. And then finally, I think one of the, the biggest things that we have achieved it's been to invite people into the uh, into the academy, so the people giving lectures that actually are well rehearsed within their topic, so they know about their science, they know about patients, for instance, but they really also know about education without necessarily being educationalists, but they know about giving information on to other people to make it easy to understand. So instead of just promoting a specific pathway or idea or research result, they try to, to give sort of the broader concepts. And we, we've, we've used a lot of uh, educational methods so that, for instance, the videos are, are quite short and, and we have these reflective questions and, and, and reading material. So I hope we've tried to create uh, a platform where people can actually go and learn from. So hopefully that's it. 
and uh, and in, in you know in the future hopefully there will be much more and covering all of the curricula completely exactly thank you there's a platform to go and learn so go and learn from it that's the that's the takeaway ed bring us home what's your you. what's your final word uh, a couple of points but keep brief um because of the time uh, i think i'd like to reiterate what uh, we heard just a moment ago around experts in pain i think there are multiple experts from a range of different backgrounds and disciplines uh both those who are working as healthcare professionals also those with lived experience i think bringing again that ethos that we often see within pain is bringing these different levels of expertise in to help develop and educate at the different levels um, I think the second element, myself from a from a psychology perspective, is that um, because of the the routes into pain aren't as clear. I think the psychology is actually having a better understanding across Europe around the different pathways that health professionals get into pain from a psychology background would be really helpful and useful. So I think there's a lot for us to learn from each other around our relevant relevant disciplines. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so that that brings today's webinar to a close. Um, thanks very much for the insightful questions, for the chat. I'm sorry we couldn't get round to all of them, but I think we managed to, to get through a fair number. Um, my particular thanks to the panellists today, Ed, Felicia and Morton, uh, but most of all, uh, thanks to all of you for attending. There's no event without an audience. Uh, just to remind you again, this has been recorded um, and it will be available in around 48 hours uh, for you to watch back, for you to share with colleagues and peers if you wish to. Um, so keep an eye out for that uh, via the EPIC website. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.